Yo, and welcome to the 166th episode of Lake of Rage, a Pokemon Trading Dragon podcast. I'm your host, as always, Kevin Clementi, aka Mellow underscore Magikarp. I'm joined today by a very special temporary guest host. Joining us for the first and hopefully not the last time, we have the one and only Josh Frank. Josh, how you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing incredibly well. I am very excited to have watched some Pokemon, and I'm excited to get to talk about these new results from the Dortmund Regional Championships. Quick look on the other side for those of you listening. We're recording this at 8 p.m. Pacific time on Sunday, which means we got all the Dortmund results for you ready to go, and we have zero of the Joinville results for you. So if you're like, I just saw the results on Limitless this morning, it's because Robin has woke up and published them. And we do not know what they are. So we're going to break down the Dortmund Regional Championships. And I've asked Josh here because, Josh, you have some heckin good results over this past two years or so, I think, is a really like big pop off, right? Yeah, definitely the last year. Uh, but I, I started playing really competitively over COVID. And so uh, this like two years ago was my first full competitive season. And then, yeah, this past year uh, on the back of Gardevoir, mostly, mostly. That's a hard um, gag. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty hard, but a lot of fun. Very rewarding, I think, to play. I played it at one regional. You do not get to say, yeah, it's kind of hard. No, that deck is <laughs> difficult to pilot sure. properly. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is difficult. I, I've given quite a few master classes on them, and every time I'm like, oh, it'll be 90 minutes, and then they end up going like three hours with a QA. and a and like, so yeah, yeah, there's a lot going on. No, that's just good value right there. You pay for <laughs> one hour, you give them three hours, now we're hey. talking. <laughs> Uh, for people who don't know, what are some of those specific accomplishments? Because you do have some like high placements in there with Gardevoir and potentially other yeah. stuff as well. But I, the Gardevoir is the one that comes to mind for me. Yeah, so uh, I got a top 64 at NAIC with Guardi. Uh, before that, I top fourd NAI, not NAIC, uh, Orlando Regionals with Guardi. Uh, also this past season, I think I had a top 32 with Arctina and a and a I bubbled top eight at Toronto with Urshifu as well. So for the most part, playing like the big brain decks, and then there's the one RCS Tina result there where I just like turn brain off, turn one judge. But yeah, it was a good season. I I uh I think I went to seven majors. I day two five of them and I converted to cash on four. So it was pretty good. That's an incredible conversion rate right there. Out of curiosity, we'll get to Dortmund, I promise. But I always have to <laughs> ask questions of people when they're here. How much yeah. do you practice playing Pokemon to get this ridiculous conversion rate? Yeah, so I actually don't... I, well, I play a little bit more now than I, I did this past season. Um, I'm really lucky to have like an amazing group of other players that I work with. Uh, of which like I am the worst player and I think you know being the dumbest person in a room is always the best place to be because you have so much so much room to grow so I work with uh, Michael Bergerak, Alex Kreckler, and Alex Shemansky and we are notorious for not playing any games we just like talk we just like kind of yap at each other mm -hmm. that's how like Alex's EUIC winning deck came about was just like us sitting in a room like yelling back and forth until we we came to a 60 but yeah, I, I play a lot of Pokemon, I would say now especially. I love that's one of those pieces of advice that you hear in pretty much everything, right? So I'll start with way before I got into Pokemon, very into weightlifting, blah, blah, blah. And yeah. every single time it was like, OK, well, how do I get started? How do I get like as a competitor in weightlifting? How do I do this? It's like you need a training partner who is better than you. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, OK, well, that doesn't work because at some point you run out of things. Right. And you've completely right. taken that and you're like, all of my testing partners better than me <laughs> yes yeah absolutely yeah there's always put yourself in a position to learn more that's that's how i feel anyway we've got you here specifically for the dortmund regional championships and to talk about the results in the stellar crown meta because we have louisville in i'm gonna say two weeks is that true yep two weeks beautiful in two weeks so people should be preparing right now or maybe you're just a fan of the game and you want to know what is happening we got it covered but before we do that we're going to get into some rapid straight questions this is your first time on the podcast. You're going to have 60 seconds to answer as many as you can with no explanation. Are you ready? Yes. Perfect. Question number one, spring or fall? Fall. What's your favorite breakfast food? Pancakes. What's your favorite retro format? Some lot. Favorite deck of all time? Clean Clang. Would you rather go to the bottom of the ocean or go to space? Space. Who would be your starter Pokemon? 
Rowlett. Do you prefer watching comedies or dramas? Dramas. Toppings on your perfect pizza. Pepperoni and pineapple. What color sleeves do you use? Mint. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Juniper, sycamore, oak, rowan, or magnolia? Juniper. What was your favorite subject in school? English. What's your favorite regional or IC location? Ooh, uh, uh, that one kind of stumped me, actually. Good. I, I think it's, prob- <laughs> it's probably London. Probably London. No way. Anyway, favorite, just, favorite I'm Halloween. sorry. <laughs> You're good. Um, Halloween. Mario Bros. or Legend of Zelda? Zelda. And that is time. I panicked, the the London. I panicked on the London. I panicked. I panicked. I panicked. I panicked. Um, I think. I think. Upon more reflection, my my actual answer might be. I, I really. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, it might be Milwaukee. No, I think Milwaukee is my actual answer because it's close to home. It's literally fifty minutes from my front door. Okay, that's a hundred percent valid. Yeah, a quick drive. Yeah. You got that. But have you been yeah. to Vancouver? It's Vancouver. It's Vancouver. <laughs> yeah, you're 100 percent right. It's Vancouver. Okay, right. there we go. I, love, I, I forgot. Know. I just <laughs> out of the brain. <laughs> I will always say for absolutely everyone, every NA Pokemon regional, Canada wins. East Coast, oh, Toronto's yeah. amazing location. West Coast, Vancouver is so good. Yeah, yeah. Vancouver was awesome. And honestly, like I got in a car crash right before Vancouver this past year. And I still, like, despite my car being totaled, had an amazing time just because of how beautiful Vancouver was. So you're right. Thank you for answering for me. Because I, <laughs> yeah, not London, not London. I mean, being 50 minutes away, if I could wake up in my own bed and drive to a regional championships, that might take over for Vancouver for me. Although Vancouver is actually the closest one to me. So eh, maybe close <laughs> enough too, right? Yeah, yeah, why not? You could, it'd just be an early wake up, right? I do know people who did that, getting up at, you know, 3 30, 4 o'clock, getting up there and checking yeah. in. It's like, all right, that's 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 a life choice. I'm not for that. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna talk about those Dortmund regional results next. So we only have some of the stuff on Limitless, though. I don't know about you. I did watch, I went back and watched all the stuff I missed when I was sleeping. I wanna say two. I am not happy with the stream starting at round 12. Because round nine was the first round of day two, so we missed nine, ten, and eleven. <laughs> like, why would they do this to us? A small indie company. That's true. I'm, most people don't company. even know they exist. Yeah. How? Yeah. How could you possibly afford to stream three more rounds? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's really rough. It's incredibly rough. As someone who's not going to travel to like anything this year. Yeah. The fact that they're like, okay, we're going to have an asymmetrical cut, so we're going to stream less rounds is very annoying. I'll just yeah. use that word. I'll start GoProing my rounds for you, Kevin, so that Ooh. you can watch the whole POV of the whatever tournaments you go, don't go to. You're going to need that 100% day two conversion rate. Are you ready for that? I will try. I will try my best. There we go. That's all we can ask for, right? Right. So I think the first thing I want to mention is the results in day one to day two we saw raging bolt and charizard at i'm just going to call them a tie because it was less than one percent difference between the two the number one decks bolt at 17 charizard at 17 percent was this something that you were expecting for both of these two decks to just not just be number one but be very noticeably above the next deck yeah i think uh I think there was kind of a uh, an obvious trend over the course of the Stellar Crown, like in Japan, their format, and even here with like some online tournaments and you know what you hear people in in like the Twitter space talking about. It was kind of I think generally expected that Charizard, Raging Bolt, and Dragapult would be one, two, and three, um, with Dragapult being like significantly lower just because there's less understanding. I think in general, of, of how to build a good Dragapult deck, which mm-hmm. I think we kind of saw to be true this, this weekend. Yeah. Um, so no, I wasn't too surprised to see Bolt at number one. I think, generally speaking, Raging Bolt is the easier of the two, and so the vast majority of players are going to be more comfortable sleeping up Raging Bolt than they would Charizard. So even if Charizard is maybe a slightly stronger deck, the average player is going to be more likely to play Raging Bolt, probably. 
And then off of that, we saw Bolt go from 17% day one into 15% day two, and Charizard go from 17% to 11% in day two. Do you yeah. believe that's something else that kind of is indicative of the power level of those decks? Is this something because they're just in such high numbers that people are going to fail more frequently with them? Can you kind of give us an idea of what you think of when you see, wow, both of these decks converted at a negative percentage, essentially? Yeah, I think on average, when you see formats where like there's anticipated best decks, but there's no like, it's not like Charizard at EUIC, right? People mm -hmm. are like, yeah, Charizard and Bolt are both probably the best decks, but people will still prepare for those decks the same way that they will for like a Lugia SIT, right? It's still going to be the most played deck. So no one is going into a regional going, oh yeah, I'll just lose to every Charizard I see. Because we've seen Charizard is a deck that can easily reach that like 25, 26% number. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a deck that is that heavily prepared for, but isn't necessarily that much better than the things below it, it's always going to have like conversion rates like this. And we, we saw something like this with like, UV Max in in like the very first tournament back from from COVID, right? You you have a lot of events like this where you see these kind of like top decks fall off. I don't think it really says anything specifically about how strong they are. I think people are just more prepared for them generally because they're expected to be higher in play. As a quick story, because this also came up on Twitter when we talked about uh someone talked about Terrapagos, which Spoiler is going to have the one of the sickest conversion rates from day one to day two ever. Yeah. And they brought up the Mu V Max thing at the start of that format. And like you said, it was incredibly anticipated. It was such an obviously powerful deck, but the exact opposite occurred because every single deck was so ready. So that's back when I actually played the yeah. game at Salt Lake City. And I went 5-0 <laughs> against Mu, I think it was. And the yeah. matchup just felt so free because I knew like every single line that I had, no matter what I was drawing, because it was more than one line. And it was just like, okay, I have practiced this matchup. Out of the probably 30 games I played to prep for that regional, good 15 to 20 of them were against Mew VMAX, right? So yeah, it's like you said, you're just targeting and targeting and targeting those decks. And uh, the next one I want to mention is Terrapagos. Terrapagos was not even on the day one graphic under the 5% of Gardevoir. Who would play that trash in this format? And then <laughs> it was the <laughs> most played deck in day two with 16% of the meta. Yeah. You are also a turtle enjoyer. Uh, winning yeah. one of the larger online tournaments we had before a Stellar Crown Regional. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised at all to see Terrapagos with this just disgusting day two conversion rate? And as we mentioned before the podcast, it was brought by arguably the best European team in the Limitless team. And yeah. it was brought by grant manley who is a part of one of the strongest north american teams as well in addition to we don't know everything else but probably plenty right. of other good players too so is this a shock for you no no i think um something that's really cool about terrapagos and uh yeah I, I won that big tournament and it was kind of my first day like actually playing with the deck and like just realizing how oppressive this deck is and how much like opportunity for skill expression and like line navigation there is like it's not a surprise to me at all that top players would choose to pilot the deck mm -hmm. and it's not a surprise to me at all that it did very well because really like in my in my opinion at least most of the lists uh, that are out there you're really only taking one bad matchup and it's charizard and honestly speaking like the charizard player still needs to get kind of lucky to beat you they have to like capitalize on their Thornton mm -hmm. immediately, or you just like push them out of the game. Like you win in three turns. This is it's like ADP, but way, way, way more skill expressive. Um, so no, I, I'm not I'm not surprised to see it do really well. Um mm -hmm. at all. It's incredibly powerful. The combination of Dusknor and Briar and Countercatcher also is just like it's ridiculous. So as someone who has played zero games with Terrapagos, uh, I've only True. played Aegislash and Lost Zone in the Stellar Crown <laughs> format, which should tell you where my mind is right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, <laughs> don't knock the Aegislash yet. Just wait. I won't, I won't. Uh, we, can you walk me through some of that oppressiveness for someone who has not played yet? What exactly is the Briar Dusknord doing for you that's so good? Sure. So basically the goal of Terrapagos, at least the iteration of it that I played, I do believe like 
the limitless cruise list specifically is is a little bit less turbo there's like buffalo in there and stuff but the version of it that that i played in and i assume you know all of them are on the dusk nor mm -hmm. your goal is to win the game in two attacks you have your first turn where you flood your board because of how ridiculous fan rotom is and then on your first turn you will your first turn attacking generally you're going to take two or three prizes utilizing that you know the dusk nor package which you can blow yourself up and you know set up for damage or you can use it to ko the little guys right so if you're against something like guardy on your first attacking turn if you go first you can dust nor ko acurlia prime catcher acurlia and they're both dead right and so you just oppress your opponent out of the game it's like <laughs> there's this joke on twitter that comes up occasionally where people are like oh i'm playing lost box control <laughs> and the control is just like you're killing all of your opponent's stuff so you're like controlling their board and that's kind of what Terrapagos is, is trying to do, right? And so you can kind of always do that. One of the ways that you would do that is via Dusknor and Briar. Mm -hmm. Briar, obviously, you take an extra prize card when your opponent is on two, and you take a KO with a Terra Pokemon. But your opponent can't play around it if you have multiple Dusknor, because you can just force them to take prizes down to two. And the ridiculous thing about Briar is that it doesn't even say, like, when you take the attack your your opponent or you take the knockout your opponent has to be a two mm -hmm. they just have to be a two when you play the card so you can go like pop one dust nor briar use another dust nor to set up for the ko and then take the extra prizes and so by controlling the way that your opponent draws their prizes you can like accelerate your game your game plan using the briar or you know using blood moon or saluna as well um which is just it's ridiculously strong that sounds incredibly disgusting like it's one of those things yeah. where you like you just describe so much. It's like, oh my gosh, that's such a big combo. Then you're like, no, you have Noctowl. And Noctowl. <laughs> you're attacking for one single energy, and you have Pheasantipity, yep. and you have Pidgeot, and like, yep. It seems pretty easy to actually pull this off. <laughs> uh, it can be. <laughs> the deck is very, very, very. Uh, I would say turn one reliant, mm -hmm. right? Like. A lot of your engine relies around the fan rotom, and so you you kind of like have to overcommit deck space to turn one consistency because if you don't get turn one fan rotom, it can be very very hard to like fill out your bench because two twenty is not a lot, but you need eight bench Pokemon to do it. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah, it, it can be. So we saw Tord Reklev as the obvious Terrapagos player moving forward, right? Ninth place yep. lost the top 16 asymmetrical cut, so it was not a bubble out, right? Looks like to me, the uninitiated, I haven't actually played, I've kind of glanced at lists, a very generic Terrapagos, Dusknor, Pidgeot list. The two Bufalon are in there. There mm. are, as you mentioned, the turn one part, right? Four Nest Balls, three Buddy Poffins. And then the Hisuian Heavy Ball, which is eh, not really a turn one consistency, but it can't be slept on necessarily, right? Right. Is this yeah. kind of the way that the deck should be built moving forward? Do you think it is a usual Tord has cracked it? Why would you ever do anything but play his exact 60? Is this kind of a generic shell at the start of a format? Like, what are your thoughts looking at this list? Yeah, I think Tord's list is really, really solid. Um, I think they're kind of like two mentalities you can have when you're looking at this deck right mm -hmm. and you can have the the mentality of like if i don't win by turn three i'm not winning the game or you can have the mentality that i think tord took which is like you know by including the buffalant you know by having the thornton in there you kind of have a little bit more longevity mm -hmm. um, and depending on the matchups that you're expecting to play against some of those things can be better some of those things can be worse uh, the Buffalant is really helpful into decks where it's like very difficult for you to turbo and they can kind of one shot you easily. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, a, a, an example of that would be like the Reggie Drago matchup, right? Where they can just, if they go first, they can kind of Kiram wipe all of your babies and it's hard for you to come back. But if you have the Buffalant, Buffalant actually keeps Pidgey and Hoot Hoot out of range of Kiram. And so having those in there can be incredibly helpful in, in specific matchups. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't think you necessarily need to play them. Um, I also think Thornton is is kind of like, it's a tech that I tried pretty early, but it's mostly because I like Thornton. Um, 
and I, I think that one is pretty interesting. Um, so I don't necessarily think that this is like the 60. This is not like towards UIC Charizard deck. Like I, I think this is a list that can very easily have some wiggle room depending on what you're trying to beat. That makes a lot of sense. Where does the wiggle room come from, though, outside of the Thornton? Because, again, as I look at this, it's like, well, I've got a lot of ball search because I need to set up, and then I've got yeah. 86 Pokemon in the deck because I need to have a bench of eight in addition to multiple stage twos <laughs> on the field at the same time. So where are you getting this flexibility? Yeah, so looking at Tord's list, I would say the flex spots are like fourth Terrapagos, uh, the two Bufalons if you decide you don't need them. Like you said, the Thornton. Um, fourth Ultra Ball theoretically can be a flex spot as well. Um, I don't think the pal pad is necessary, especially if you're going for a more like win in three turns kind of build. Oftentimes you're not going to have the ability to utilize it quite as much. So there's definitely some spots depending on what you're trying to do. Oh, the heavy ball as well. I don't think heavy ball is, is a necessary inclusion. Um, so yeah, depending on what you're trying to beat, what you're trying to include, right? There's a plethora of potential text that you can put in the deck in order to beat or be stronger into certain matchups. Um, but those would be the spots that I would look at specifically. Um, I would not play less than 3-3 Noctowl, though. Uh, I will say that right here with my full chest. Uh, I know some early lists were playing 2-2 Noctowl. Don't. 3-3. 100% 3-3. The concept of 2-2 sounds so strange to me. I would really yeah. be tempted to play like a 4-3 or a 4-4 because Jewel Seeker is such an incredible ability. Yeah. I, I would need to be sold on people why they were ever running a 2-2. I'm kind of need to be sold on a 3-3, three, three, honestly, as opposed to a 4-4. Four, four. Can you sell me on why it's not a 4-4? Four, four? Uh, I don't think specifically I can. I think for, like, my version of the deck right now, I'm playing 3-3. Three, three, and, again, the reason is, like, you win in three turns. Usually, turn one, you set up. Turn two, you will use two Noctowls, one to set up your Pidgeot, and one to, like, get the things that you want. And so then, on your last turn, you will need one more Noctowl to finish your combo right? Mm -hmm. um, and so if you are concerned with prizing, then a lot of times maybe you want to play the the 4-3. Um, I had 4-3 in the list for a little bit, but uh, I went back to the 3-3 three, three for the more turbo version. I actually think this version of the deck could benefit from 4-4 four, four Noctowl, um, but Tord also has uh, the Thornton in there. So you can just mm -hmm. get like, the first thing you're ever discarding if they ever bump area zero is you discard the Noctowls because then Night Stretcher becomes an out to Noctowl. Um, so especially with the Thornton in there, uh, that's probably where he is like flexing that spot, right? He's got the heavy ball, he's got the Thornton, and so you don't really need the fourth Hoot Hoot if you're always going to have access to an extra one. That makes sense. I also want to mention, you said the first Noctowl sets up your Pidgeot pieces. The Jewel Hunt for Rare Candy Feather Ball both makes me want to vomit and it makes me want to go play Pokemon right now because that is so disgusting. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Last thing on Tropicos before we move on to the decks that I guess technically made top eight. We're focusing on the ninth place list right now. Right, right. The Ursa Luna. It's the Tord tax. I mean, <laughs> I gotta say, if Tord plays a deck, I have to give it a decent amount of testing and attention and yeah, etc. Um, Ursa Luna. You kind of mentioned Ursa Luna at the a little bit about all those combo pieces but it's not a terra pokemon you're using it no. in the late game you're using mm. it in the turns where briar might be the best thing yeah. it does 20 more damage than the tropagos yes. does why is this card in the deck uh that 20 more damage is the difference between KOing a raging bull and not KOing a raging bull okay that's it's, <laughs> so it's purely not purely necessarily this might be other cute things but yeah it is a largely a raging bolt tech yeah i mean it's valuable in a lot of places there is a lot of value also like late in the game when you're getting iono right mm -hmm. especially if you have to use double noctowl early you can be kind of susceptible to something like an iono something like a roxanne and so if you can't get all of your combo right to to do the briar or to hit that max damage with Terrapagos, you can literally like with no bench just go dusk pop a one prizer dusk pop a one prizer and then oh you're at one prize all right blood moon for free right and so the the 240 like you can say like yeah it's 20 more damage but that's not always the case, right? Tropagos is 220 is conditional and Ursulunas isn't. Mm -hmm. And so that can be very, very strong. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and the extra, actually, the extra uh, 30 HP, I think, matters a lot, too, because it's kind of easy for some stuff, even opposing Ursaluna, right, to hit the 240. Yeah. Uh, but they can't always kill Ursaluna. That's true, that's true. The 260 is uh, quite annoying for a handful of decks out there. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and backwards order from this top cut. Again, we don't have quite all the things. Next one up was Lugia. We'll get to Lugia later. Spoilers, got second. We have a Maridon in seventh place as well. A Maridon running some area zero. Yep. Secret box is the A spec. Is this a, this was just the turbo deck that got through. There's also Raging Bolt, which we'll get to later. Is this just like turbo deck that got through. Are there merits to Maridon now that it has the area zero under depths with the Terra Mewtwo, which is still crazy to me that that's the card in this deck. What do you think about Maridon? Is it just turbo deck or is it better? I think Maridon's good. Um, Maridon is basically still Maridon. It mm -hmm. just now has like a theoretically higher damage cap with Raikou, which is, it, it makes your rate, again, it makes your Raging Bolt matchup better. But some of those like places where Raikou couldn't like quite reach the numbers, um, the Area Zero helps there a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, something else that I really, really, really like about the top eight list from Dortmund is that they play multiple ways to bump their own stadium. And so they can kind of overcommit in the early game. Mm -hmm. And then by removing their own area zero can remove some of these liabilities. They can remove the squawk. You know, if something gets damaged, like an iron hands with a bravery charm, whatever it might be. You know, if you're trying to remove that Radiant Greninja against Turtles as well, because one of Turtles' best plays, uh, if you take the first two, is to uh, let you take four after they take two. So it's four to four to two. Mm -hmm. And then they go Briar. They will dust nor pop your Greninja, and then they will knock something out for their last three, right? So they win in two attacks. And so having the ability to bump the area zero means that you can just put a six Pokemon down and remove it from play. So I think that is very cool for Maridon because it's a deck that very frequently has to put these low HP two prizes in play. And so it gives you some play around with that. Um, I like. That. I think the deck's good. Yeah, I think the deck's real good. That's just something I want to reiterate how good that is and how I didn't notice that whatsoever, which is, again, why I've asked you here, person who plays the game much more than I do. We have two ways to bump it, and you mentioned the Tropagos matchup. That's also a matchup where if you're not playing yours, they will play theirs, right? And so you can go right. wide with the setup Pokemon, but then you do need something to clean up. As you said, the Squawk ability is a great example of that thing is just, you look at it funny and it's getting knocked out. And I really like that yeah. Greninja line as well, one where... Something I've learned through Raging Bolt also, the Greninja can lose you the game because the Dusknoir is hitting that exact amount that it needs yep. in order to <laughs> KO that Greninja, which is now not just a free consistency Pokemon, it's possibly more of a liability than the Squawk ability. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Especially now that Briar exists. And that, mm -hmm. I mean, that goes for Zapdos too, right? Like, it's the same kind of concept. Yeah, and the Zapdos really depends on, like, when does the math matter versus when does it not matter, right, too? Because... Yeah. Now Raikou, like you said, hits a lot. And so the Vitality Band plus Zapdos into Raging Bolt with your Maridon to hit 240. I mean, it's so cool, but Still you can cool. also just fill your bench up. Yeah, and you're also right. in a good spot. Yep, yep, absolutely. Uh, any other thoughts on Maridon, or is it just like, yeah, the deck did the thing? Yeah, I well, one thing that I would briefly like to mention is yeah. we saw a lot of like online results and to an extent some Japanese results as mm -hmm. well. Um, Maridon wasn't super, super popular in like city leagues, but... Uh, a lot of them were going down to one Iron Hands, uh, which blew my mind. Like, Spoken so like much Gardy of what player. makes the... Right, right. Like, I was like, this is crazy. Like, you just lose to Guardy now. That was the first thought that I had. And so I'm happy to see... Happy in, like, a general metagaming sense, not in a personal sense, that, that you know, a list that plays two Iron Hands did succeed, because that is how you should be playing the deck. Like... Yes, it's cool that Raikou now can do this extra damage, but please do not forget that Iron Hands is one of, if not the most broken card in the game. <laughs> so oh, keep yeah. your two Iron Hands in there. <laughs> the Iron Hands are... I want to just go back to the Tarapagos matchup real quick, because this is one that I purely theorized with a friend who we're both trying to figure out our turbo deck because we're both dads. And sure. the idea was Maridon is better in a Tarapagos because Tarapagos doesn't have to bench a turtle against anything, right? You're just like, oh, I got a bench space open, or I'm going to pop yep. a dust or whatever, right? 
And it's like, well, I'm going to iron hands you. So I still go ahead on that two, two, two prize race. And is that something yep. that in that matchup is incredibly valuable or is that kind of a flawed line where I just haven't played it and don't understand? No, you're right. You're right. Uh, Terrapagos' line, at least as far as I have been playing it into most of these turbo decks, is to force them through a one prizer because yeah. you don't need to bench Terrapagos turn one. Um, and so the fact that Maridon can say, it's cool that you do that, but uh, amp. Yeah. Uh, like, it's it's very good. So I, I would definitely say Maridon is the strongest turbo deck into Turtles specifically. And I think given how well Turtles converted might have something to do with why Maridon was able to succeed. Don't know what this guy's matchups were, but um, I could totally see in a field of Terrapagos a Maridon player being like, oh yeah, I'm farming. The next one up is we had an Iron Thorns also in top eight. This is another deck <sighs> where... Okay, that could have also been all of the listeners listening to this, can like all together sighing. So I don't know. Yeah, if that was you or them. <laughs> We're just gonna keep going. Yeah. The Iron Thorns won the Pokemon World Championships not too long ago. It did. Baltimore it did. mostly disappeared. There were some here and there. One lost the win, and if I remember correctly. But again, mm. everyone's like, it's not a real deck, right? And everyone's still like, oh well, now the deck's even less of a real deck because Noctowl exists, right? Is this a real deck? Yeah, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> of, course, of course it is, <laughs> right? I mean, like, <laughs> here's here's my like my good answer to the question is like, yes, Iron Thorns is a deck, right? <laughs> like historically, cards that do what Iron Thorns does are incredibly, incredibly, incredibly powerful. Yeah. I will put an asterisk here and say that it is a deck that is incredibly easy to beat mm -hmm. if you want to beat it. Uh, and so what happens is people just are like, that deck is fake, and then don't respect it or don't practice against it, right? Like we just talked about how everyone spends all their time practicing into Charizard, and mm -hmm. you'll hear a lot of top players talk about how these control-style archetypes, not that Iron Thorns is control, but you know what I'm saying, right? Alternative win-con archetypes, mm -hmm. like, they win so many of their games because people don't know how to play against them. And so, yes, Iron Thorns is a real deck, but I think, assuming everyone is playing optimally at all times, it never has deep runs, because, like, the card is not that good. <laughs> like, really, really, it's not. That's so good. <laughs> 140, and then, uh-oh, I have to move my energy, so hope I have one next turn. Like, it's fine. It's, yeah, it's it's fine. I think Iron Thorns is a real deck. Uh, do I think that people would be better as players if they started respecting control archetypes and, like, learning how to play against them? Also, yes. <laughs> Spoken like a coach. Uh, yeah, Iron Thorns is, I've not seen the list. It might be out there on Twitter. It's not currently on Limitless. I can't imagine it is anything special. I'd love to be proven wrong. I would love for sure. it to be super wild, run generators or something. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm in. It's Yeah, exactly, right? This deck's broken. But it should be <laughs> a deck that you respect. That and Snorlax. Yes. So Snorlax did not make an appearance in the top. I don't think it even made it to the top 12, which was the asymmetrical cut, if I'm remembering correctly. But both of those decks going into Louisville, and I'm not going to Louisville, so I can leak all of my mid-level thoughts. <laughs> you should definitely make sure you know how your deck handles both of those two, because they seem to be in perfectly fine spots, and you don't are, want yeah. to lose just because you didn't know what you were doing. Right. Are you going to respect Thorns tech-wise for Louisville? Or is it like, a, I think most decks can handle it if they know what they're doing, and I feel confident that I'm going to know what I'm doing? That's a good question. I think it ultimately will depend what I end up playing. Because some decks can't handle it, right? Like, if I'm playing Lugia with no tech for Iron Thorns, like, Who cares? I'm not winning, right? Yeah. Like I, So, no, I, I don't think every deck can... can just handle it naturally. It'll it'll depend what I end up playing. But I think on average, right, you see a lot of people losing to Iron Thorns when they should be beating it or mm -hmm. losing to Snorlax when they should be beating it. So if I play a deck that should be beating it, I'm not going to tech for it. Valid. 
Uh, next one up is we have one of my absolute favorites. We have, I haven't been saying everyone's name. Shout out to Stephen Law or potentially Stefan Law for the Iron Thorns finish. And shout out to Jan Houseman for Raging Bolt, the fifth place deck. I'm a huge Bolt fan. I want to say why I love Bolt. And then you, wait, you're a Bolt fan? Yeah, yeah I, I love, I love Raging thank Bolt. You. I have been, so I am also a consumer of a lot of Pokemon media. And mm. boy, do I want to yell at my headphones every single time people are like, that's not a real deck. It's fake. It won in Japan, but Japan's a meme. So who cares? I'm like, no, 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 no. He's, you you know you've heard it i saw the look on your face listeners if you're not there was a like oh my gosh did anyone say you know someone said that and no <laughs> of course yeah of that. course of course yeah you're 100 right i am a huge fan of raging bolt we saw raging bolt on the winning in, in round nine sorry round eight against isaiah bradner actively throw incredibly hard and the deck was still doing some pretty amazing things i am sorry if you're that person please go watch azul's commentary over it because there was stuff that i'm like this is wrong and then azul found even more on top of that it it could have gone a little bit better i'm a huge bolt fan i think the power level is insane i think that the deck is harder to pilot than people say which makes the mediocre conversion rate there is a lot with this deck about oh my gosh you're actually agreeing with me i am i was not 100 uh there yeah. is a lot about bench management there is a lot about resource management you should never ever lose a game to iona with this unless there's okay the occasional one right sure so, sure yeah but for the most part you should be setting yourself up where iono is not bodying you in any way yeah. shape or form that is not the reason you lose with this deck um a couple things about the list as we get in there, because I will love to hear you gas up Bolt as much as you would like to. Sure. Their single prizer of choice. They had the Greninja, but they also ran a 101 Dusknor with the one candy and obviously the Pokestop quote unquote engine. I'm going to call it that. Yeah. Is the yeah. Dusknor the <laughs> thing now? Is Bolt a real good deck? Let's start there because you were in agreement. Should Bolt still be the number one played turbo deck? um should it be yeah i think is is a is a different question than than will it be okay will it be is a free space on a bingo card i will call right now louisville number one most played turbo deck possibly number one most played deck it's going to be raging bolt people are going to play raging bolt i utmost confidence after watching this game for years and knowing north americans love to ram their head against the wall and go boom i say that as again a raging bolt believer (laughs) (laughs) should it be is the question yeah, should it be, I think, is is a bit tougher to answer, right? Mm-hmm. I think given the results that we saw, there's a very real argument that Maridon should be the number one played turbo deck. Generally speaking, Maridon's worst matchup is Charizard. Mm-hmm. Where was it? That's right? True. And and generally speaking, right, if we're looking at the turbo decks and how they fare into the decks that did well, mm-hmm. Bolt might be slightly more favored into Dragapult than Maridon, but they're probably both favored into Dragapult. Maridon is significantly more favored into Lugia. Maridon is significantly more favored into Palkia. Presumably, Maridon is significantly more favored into Goldango. For the same reason as, like, it's better into Terrapagos, right? Where they can, yeah. like, force you through a one-prizer and then whatever, whatever. Uh, and if I am looking at the results of the tournament... Maridon seems like a really, really, really good play. Uh, So I would say should it be is probably a no. Because I do think Bolt historically will struggle. Not historically. It hasn't happened yet. I do think Bolt historically struggles more with decks like Lugia. If you don't KO the first Lugia, it's going to struggle a little bit more with, you know, Goldango forcing you through a one-prizer. It's going to force you. It's going to be a little bit worse into something like Palkia if you can't KO that first you know, Palkia V. Um, I want to mention on the Golden Go matchup, just because I live in Washington where everyone from Washington decided to bring that deck. And so I played against it. Yeah, as I was a Bolt fan, that (laughs) matchup is so free. The Golden Go player can fall asleep and win that matchup. Like, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. As as Bolt, I don't know if your opponent flips over a gimme ghoul, go get an early lunch. It's so miserable. (laughs) It makes sense, right? It makes sense. Uh, and maybe maybe this version of Bolt is a little bit better into Goldango because you can mm-hmm. sort of cheese that prize back with the Dusknor. True. Uh, I don't know. I, I would need to play. I also, I'm talking like Goldango will be like a <laughs> big deck after this tournament, which is probably not going to be true, right? 
But I hope it is. Just looking at results. Oh my god, yeah, I would love it. I would love it. I bought Alt Art Goldangos like a year ago, thinking I would play the deck, and I haven't sleeved them up once. So if it's if it's good, I'm, I'm down. Yeah, I'm if it's good, I'm down. But yeah, I I, I think should it be probably not. Mm-hmm. I think Raging Bolt was the best turbo deck for this tournament. Um. But I, I think Maridon probably will end up being the better one for, for Louisville. All right, Bolt Believer. The 101 Dusk Noor. Obviously, there's a like, yeah. well, I would need to try it. Is this going to be standard? Is this something that you're like, and I think this is now in a good place. Like, what are your thoughts on that 101 Dusk Noor? Yeah, I think the 101 Dust Noir is cool. It's similar to what we talked about with Terrapagos, right? Having Dust Noir and Briar means that you can more easily force your opponent to, you know, two prizes. Um, a lot of times against Charizard specifically, you end up having this like weird like game where Charizard forces you through a one prizer and then you KO Pidgeot and then they'll like attack you with Radzard mm-hmm. and so or and like Turo their big Charizard so you can't win with Briar. And so you like kind of need to do something. And in theory, that something can be the Dustnor, right? You can Dustnor pop a, a Charmander or a Pidgey or whatever. Um, and then you can Briar for your last two on the Radzard. And I think, like, I can see places where it would be very strong um, in, like, any of the, the like, one prize matchups, I'm going to say, because, like, I include Guardi in this. Mm-hmm. Being able to steal a prize is very, very good. Um, just generally speaking, I think a really good way to think about prize mapping is how many attacks do I need to win this game? And Dusknor takes that number and says minus one, right? Yeah. In a lot of matchups. And so I do think that that's good because it's different than like Sandy Shocks or Flutter Main, where like, yeah, you can sort of like force your opponent through a one prizer for you. So when you're doing that, you're trying to plus one to how many attacks does your opponent need to win the game, right? But we have mm-hmm. lots of gust in format, so it doesn't always work. Dusknor, you get to choose, right? You can pop it at your own, like, pace and so that gives you more agency to mess with that prize map right and so i like it in that sense is it consistent i don't know i would need to play it because i also think that bolt is a deck that generally succeeds by just being like the most consistent version of itself so it's kind of a non-answer but like yeah i could see where dustner would be good but i'm not sure that it'll be standard off the dust part, there's something else about this list, which is the one singular gust effect prime catcher. Otherwise, we have bundle and we have dust snore to attack the bench. Is that something mm-hmm. else that you think is just purely for this list? Is that something they were able uh, who was it? Jan? Jan was able to get away with because people were like, all right, these three catchers in there, they're gonna come out eventually. There's still a boss in there that's gonna come out eventually. Like, what do you think of when you see that zero or sorry, one gust being the pink card, the prime catcher? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't, I don't like it. Is the answer? Um, I'm sure it can work. I'm sure it can work. I mean, top eight, right? This clearly worked. <laughs> right, right. And like, most people will play around like catcher, prime catcher. They're not go- necessarily going to be playing around only bundle being that sort of like push option. Um, and especially paired with Dusknor, something that's really interesting is like a lot of decks to play around bundle will just bench a one prizer, right? Mm-hmm. But if you Dusknor pop the one prizer before you bundle, you're kind of guaranteeing yourself that they will have to push a two prizer at you, um, which is cool, which is cool. But I don't know, it, it makes me uneasy. Like I, I get scared when like Alf students be like, yeah, I cut down to two Pokemon catcher. I'm like, mm, are you sure? Two's fine. It is fine. Just it is heads. fine. It is fine. It is fine. You are right. I, I cannot disagree with you. The math suggests that you are right. If you play two catchers and use both of them in a game, on average, you will hit one heads, right? So you're right. It is fine. I just am miserably unlucky. So I, <laughs> when I play two catcher, I'm like, I'm flipping double tails. Every time. Double tails. Double tails. You just want to flip so, more tails. That's genius. <laughs> right, right. It's right. a better tweet. You're right. You're right. It does. It's a good point. Uh, any other thoughts on the Bolton, specifically the Bolt list, which was a little bit different than the one we saw at Worlds? 
No, I don't think I don't have any specific thoughts on the list. I think the list is cool. Obviously, like it's always fun to see archetypes like this, where people are like, you, you know, they tend to write off turbo decks as like. And I'm guilty of this as well, like calling something an Oonga Boonga deck and then being like, yeah, it's solved. Like, just play all your four ofs and like do whatever. So it's always really cool to have somebody like take the time to really innovate an archetype like this because most people won't. And I do agree with you. I, I actually, and I was talking to Grant Shen about this at one of our, one of our cups, like Raging Bolt feels like a deck that doesn't require a lot of skill because oftentimes you don't get punished for playing incorrectly. Mm -hmm. That's why. That's why, but like Raging Bolt as a deck has pretty intricate sequencing on every single turn of the game. Like you need to know exactly what resources you need to finish the game, how likely you are to do that, what cards you can thin, when is it right to pokey stop? Like these are all things that you need to consider. And people are like, yeah, this deck is easier than Lugia. And I'm over here like you are just like, you're just not getting punished because a lot of the lists are built in a way that it's kind of hard to get punished for mm -hmm. like some of these micro decisions that you're messing up so I, I tend to agree with you i don't think bolt is like it's not guardy it's not lost box no, it's probably no. not even charizard no. but like it's harder it's harder than other decks i'm also glad someone agrees with me on that one because it's so rare <laughs> yeah. but yeah there's always the little lines of play of like okay i'm gonna energy retrieval for one singular grass and you have the choice of no energy retrieval to keep it in deck use one to get another energy on the field or grab two things out of there. And they're like, well, I'm out of vessel. So there's actually bad to put another energy back into my hand. Right. And I should right. use it because getting the extra energy on the field is more important than keeping the retrieval in the deck for a poke stop out and off an Iono. And yeah, yeah, I've put too much brain power into this deck for me picking a deck that is supposed to require zero brain power to do well. <laughs> it can, it can, you can just like, like slam your face on the table and like play yeah. whatever card comes out of your hand, but and to win. play it optimally, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot more going on. Uh, the next one up, we have it in top four now. Stefan Ivanov with Palkia yeah. Dusknor. I don't know what the differences are from this one and the ninth place list from Baltimore, and that would have been a good question. thing to grab. Uh, there are no new cards in this list, quote unquote new, as in from Stellar Crown. Is right. Palkia Dusknor with, again, that Pokestop engine, is this a real deck we should be respecting? Should this deck be a meta deck? Like, is this Stefan just being a two-time IC champion and then doing well because he's better than most people? Where does the Palkia stuff fall for you when you look at this? Yeah, I think this deck, one of its major strengths for me, and one of the things that I think like makes it a strong archetype right now, is you have like infinite ways to attack flexibly right mm -hmm. you can take ko's in like a an absurd amount of ways um in this deck like you have the greninja ex you have the radiant greninja you can even attack with like you know ursaluna like you have all of these like different things i kind of built that up to be like ursaluna was going to be something crazy but like you get what i'm saying right yeah. there are so many ways to attack so many different pokemon in an opposing deck that like it's just really good it's just really good palkia dustner i think it was a very underexplored archetype for worlds and even for baltimore um the major difference i see here with stefan's list versus grafton's list mm -hmm. uh is there's stefan took out the rotom which i think i agree with uh he went for a higher uh a higher ear account um which makes sense to me but this yeah. kind of like turbo Dusknor archetype with Pokestop, right? You only have a couple of options for it, and it's like Banette and Palkia, and Palkia is the more aggressive option. But I think, realistically, like, Heavy Night Stretcher, Pokestop, Dusknor is just kind of a crazy thing. It's like a very, very powerful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and like, this deck can easily take like four or five prize turns. So while I think part of it is certainly you know, Stefan is a ridiculous player. You know, the, he had five, I think, other people playing the same 60 with him, and I don't think anyone else made day two. Mm -hmm. So I think there is some, to some extent, like, Stefan is just, like, an insane player. But I do think this this archetype deserves respect, and I personally think it's the better of the, of the Palkia archetypes right now. I want to go back real quick to what you mentioned about the Ursaluna, where you're like, oh, I made it sound like it was going to be this big thing, and it's just an Ursaluna. But something that Ursaluna yeah. has been doing 
is giving these decks the ability to play very little attackers. Like this deck has a pretty low sustain Pokemon, right? It's like Greninja attacks for essentially one, the Palkia attacks for two, but actually chaining these attackers is difficult. There's a 2 2 Palkia, there's a 101 Greninja line, and then the Palkia can only star portal once, otherwise, there's no acceleration. It lets you right. have these mediocre starts and have a third attacker who can hit gigantic numbers. In addition to obviously the Dust Snore and stuff like that. So I think that Ursa Luna should get a ton of respect. And Maridon's another deck where you only have to set up two attackers and then your third attacker is pre-set up, which is incredibly good. So I think that is something that should not be slept on in this deck when you're looking at no. what is a massive lack of anything really going on in this deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. It's It's kind of the same ethos as like, why you would play Ursaluna in in Tropagos, right? Mm -hmm. Like you inherently as a Dusknor deck are kind of blowing up your whole bench. And when your attacker relies on those bench Pokemon in order to do damage, and you can like accelerate to your Ursaluna not by attaching energy, but by blowing up your Dusknor and forcing mm -hmm. your opponent to take prizes, like that's a very, very cool option. Um, and I actually, like, I said that, like, Dusknor, Briar, Countercatcher as a combo was kind of toxic, but I actually think Dusknor, Ursa Luna is an incredibly, incredibly cool, like, game design decision. I think that is so. Mm -hmm. Wow, you're pro Dusknor, so the anti-Dusknor folks can come at you. Find me on Twitter. Let's go. <laughs> uh, do you have any thoughts on the Palkia <laughs> list? Uh, no, like I said, I, I like the Irida, uh, but otherwise I think it's a pretty standard, like, Palkia, Dustnor kind of thing. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I really like it. Stefan is, I mean, Stefan is one of my idols as a player, so uh, I have nothing but but respect for him. This is a, an awesome deck, and no one's surprised to see him top fouring another regional. No, I want to point out before we talk about the third place person, uh, two of the last three were on our Worlds preview where we had some short interviews, so shout out to them shout out to the world's preview because i'm always happy when i i see i'm like this person should be featured and then they do the thing and it's like i'm so much better at metagaming <laughs> player success than actual tournaments <laughs> but talent have, scout just wait till louisville you're making top eight i'm giving it's right official we're in <laughs> uh, we have gel with the golden go in third place and of course when you click on this man's limitless page you have Third place Golden Go here, 14th Golden Go in Stockholm, 266th in EUIC, 55th in Utrecht, and then second in Dortmund last year. This, I'm pretty sure it just, he is a Golden Go at this point. I, full transparency, I skipped over the stream game of Golden Go and did not get to watch it quite yet. So I don't have any idea what's really going on with this deck, but I can only imagine it's the usual Palkia, Pheasantipity, the little guys, etc. Yeah. Is this a real deck? What do you think about Golden Go? Is this the deck we should be playing? Is this the new tier one broken archetype? Turbo the deck. Let's go. I funny enough, I was I was talking um uh in my team group chat for, mm -hmm. for TSS earlier, and I said that Goldango was just like Palkia Noctowl, but better. <laughs> because you don't have to put like like who needs Noctowl when you're drawing like six cards naturally a turn with your Goldangos and like it's kind of the same thing except you have a much higher damage cap, right? They they take similar matchups, they kind of have similar play styles. And I actually kind of think Goldango might just be a better version of the the Palkia Noctowl Terrapagos because you just don't need as much to pull off all of your stuff. Mm -hmm. Like Palkia might look more impressive, right? Uh but I think Goldango kind of accomplishes the same thing. Uh, it tends to be a deck that people just, like, really, really disrespect. Um, and I get it. It hasn't always been great. Uh, but I, I think Jell has kind of proven, like, you don't take a deck to, to that many placements over and over and over again for nothing, right? Yes. Because we've seen, I mean, we've seen plenty of times people have a lot of success with the deck when it's really good, and then they try to play it when it's not as good, and they they don't do as well. But mm -hmm. that isn't really like the case here. Man has won fourteen thousand dollars with Goldango in the last year. 
making it rain for himself. Just like, Ooh. I mean, That's a you lot. know, it's a, it's a lot. That's a lot. So I, I don't, I don't, again, I don't have any specific insight mm-hmm. uh, into Goldango. Two of my good friends, Jarek and Jeremy Gumilla, were two of like the first people to day two with Goldango. So they're always yapping about it. But I mean, Gel's kind of shutting his mouth and just doing it, you know, just oh, yeah. like, so yeah, props to him. That's awesome. It's the the quote, the Pokemon quote that's like, strong Pokemon, weak Pokemon are like oh, yeah. the ramblings of like weak <laughs> trainers. Strong trainers try to win with their favorites. And like, hey, there you go. Seems to be working out. It's working incredibly well. There's many lessons that we could learn, but yeah, I don't know any of them. Let's <laughs> <laughs> begin with the consistency. Let's go into the second place. So I would like to point out too, neither of the finalists were from the continent of Europe. We had a Japanese player and a US player. Yeah. We saw Rahul Reddy with the most inconsistent pile that no one could ever do well with. This deck cannot set up. How do people win with it? And we have seen the top cut three tournaments in a row with the exact same 60. A 60 that I would like to remind everyone, everyone insulted. Everyone's like, why is there a Raikou in there? What is happening with the one Earthen Vessel and the one basic lightning energy? Why is there a 1-1 Sinchino? You definitely need another one, maybe even another two in there. There's the one of Jacques. Like, this is terrible. The deck is inconsistent. The 60 is terrible. He got lucky because Lugia is lucky. Did Rahul get... Is he now officially the luckiest Pokemon player on Earth? Yes or yes? (laughs) Uh, well... Option B, I guess. Which <laughs> so yes. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, yeah. I he has to be, right? Like I I have kind of like built my popularity in the Pokemon community being a Lugia hater. Uh <laughs> if you go to my Twitter and scroll back, like I've tweeted Lugia sucks at least like 50 times. Mm-hmm. And and I'm I'm not a Rahul hater. I think Rahul is a fantastic player. And again, I think something that is important to Talk about that, like, you hear everyone say, right? If a good player decides to play a deck, it doesn't really matter what the deck is. A good player can always do good. Mm -hmm. Um, And Rahul, obviously, is, like, insanely comfortable with the 60, especially going into new formats. That kind of comfort is very, very, very valuable because you have a lot of people piloting decks that they don't have a lot of experience with. Uh, So there are, you know, we could theorize about all of these things of, like, why did Rahul do well? But I think that the answer is quite simple. Like, Lugia is an inherently powerful deck. He acknowledges, like, you usually brick one out of three games, but as long as you play two, if you can win all of them, that's probably what it is, right? Like, his list, while it does seem more inconsistent... Um, you know, my testing group ended up playing a pretty similar thing to NAIC. Mm-hmm. We had the basic lightning energy and the earthen vessel in there. We didn't play Raikou, but we played like the second iron hands. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the kind of like thought process behind that is really understandable. Very, very good into Charizard, any deck that plays Pidgeot, right? Um, so for me, like, I'm just not that surprised when I see Rahul succeed because he's a, he's a great player. Yes. Um, so I yeah, long-winded answer to be like Lugia still sucks. I think Rahul is just really good. Like <laughs> you will never get me. I I went to a cup last weekend. I like didn't mm-hmm. sleep all night, and I had this brilliant idea at like five a.m. and I was like, oh my god, I'm gonna not sleep. Oh, no. I'm gonna play Lugia to a league cup yeah. because if I do if I do bad, I can blame it on the fact I didn't sleep. But if I do well, I can be like Lugia is the easiest deck to play. It's so dumb. Like as long as you just draw your stuff, and I I lost in top eight, which feels like kind of the worst world because I can't really do either of them but like i don't know i still think the deck is not very good but like (laughs) when it when it works which is uh, for other people i guess it works lots of times but whenever i play it my hand is like lumineon gift 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 jet jet dt and i'm like okay just draw better obviously right yes good advice sorry honestly do you have medify can i I can i get the link 20 20 bucks for that (laughs) cool Uh, I do want to mention this list. There's a couple of things about it. Uh, one, it was made by Victor Aung, who we've had on multiple times, and I think is yeah. arguably the best deck builder in the game. At the very least, the best deck builder who is not a grinding super top player. I love the stuff sure. he comes up with. Yeah, I think that's a big, right? Like, there's like Tord. Okay, that's 
that's less fun. I don't want to say Bradner. It's less fun, right? I think Victor is an incredible deck builder. I love the stuff he comes up with. And he it's is. always just a little bit off the wall. And the Raikou yeah. is something, just in case you don't know, uh, the Raikou is there for Pidgeot EX, right? And that is a big deal because you have a very efficient thing that can KO the Pidgeot EX, specifically in the Charizard matchup. But yep. In Dragapult matchup, question mark if Dragapult still plays Pidgeot after this, who knows? And then uh, Terrapagos is another deck that now they have the Pidgeot as well, and who knows mm -hmm. where else Pidgeot might show up. So I am a big fan of this exact 60. If I were going to play Lugia yeah. at Louisville, and I will neither play Lugia nor be at Louisville, so this means nothing, I would play this exact 60. Do you think... <laughs> <laughs> that this is the 60. Is there a reason to touch a single card at this point? Um, so personally, and I'm I'm not playing Lugia to, to Louisville for reasons previously stated, <laughs> but I have a few I have a few students playing Lugia. Um, and ultimately I think that a good reason to not play this 60 is that if you are a better player, you will win most games where you play the game. Mm -hmm. This list is inherently less consistent than something like Kieran Farah's list from Baltimore. Um, and so I think there's a very real argument to play Kieran's list as well. Um, it just kind of depends on what you expect the meta to be. I think the Raikou loses some value uh, by Charizard going down in play. Because I actually don't think I don't think the Raikou actually helps your Tropicos matchup that much. Fair. Um I played none of yeah. either side of it. <laughs> Yeah, and it obviously, like, again, it is very, very, very good into any deck that plays Pidgeot, but, like, winning or losing against Terrapagos usually comes down to does Lugia take two prizes on their second turn going first, mm -hmm. and Raikou doesn't help with that if Terrapagos just doesn't put a two-prizer in play. Uh, so I'm not sure that this is the exact, like, right 60. Yeah. I do agree with you, though. I, I would I would like to give a, a huge shout-out to Victor Ong. Um He's a former teammate of mine, and, and we, you know, are both writers for Shemansky's Corner, so we've gotten to talk about quite a lot of, of deck building stuff, and uh, he is, he's like, a, he has a, a fantastic, fantastic mind for the game. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, the creativity that he has, and I know, like, him and Rahul worked on Rahul's Urshifu list that he piloted to top 16 last season, and like, yeah, huge shout out to Vic, he's, he's a great player, really, really. Oh my gosh, there's something else, oh, Lugia. Is this going to be... Going into Louisville, we have a couple weeks. Yeah. But the community tends to do this thing where, uh -oh. you no, know, you know this. And in fact, you are one of the <laughs> leaders of this movement. Uh oh. <laughs> we bury our head in the sand and say, Lugia's not real. It can't hurt me. They're always going to flip tails on Mesagoza. And then we're not bringing our Sinnoh or Enhanced Hammer or whatever. <laughs> That's not fair. I have played Temple of Sinnoh in my last two Guardi lists. Okay. My worlds list and NAIC list. You, you have to respect it. You have to respect it. I, I I agree with you. I agree with you. It it feels bad. I was just having this conversation earlier today at a cup. It feels terrible to respect Lugia. It hurts like like deeply, deeply. It hurts me to include a card to beat Lugia because I know fifty percent of the time they're beating themselves. But my God, does it feel bad to lose to Lugia? that it just like hurts deep deep in the in the in the soul it hurts really bad so just tech for it like basically every deck that can tech for lugia just wins the matchup if you tech for it so just do it just do it i also think it's a great idea to tech for lugia right now like we can make naic happen again we can make most of the lugias fail if yeah we all do our part yeah yeah the last deck that we should mention is, of course, the winning deck. Ryuki Okada with Dragapult. You say, oh, what was Dragapult's partner? Dragapult's partner was Dracloak. <laughs> there was not much going on except they wrote him, the Luminion, uh, Radiant Alakazam, and then Dragapult pieces. They played Fez too, right? Yes, there was Fez and Dippity, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. This was a deck that, after we watched Shintaro play it on stream, again, everyone in the West... What a meme. Why do they do these things? Who would ever play something like this, right? A world champion and a world's runner up. Ryuki ran similar, same 60. I don't actually know. I do know it is the same vibe of the deck. And again, right. everyone's going to say this. They're not saying it yet. We're not going to say it on this pod. Actually, that's not true. I don't know what you're going to say. I'm not going to say this is silly deck building 
no way this is going to work. I don't know how he got there because I watched that top 16, the asymmetrical cut round with Tord, where just absolutely demolish those poor turtles that's not true the turtles were fine <laughs> everything around the turtles everything got else, demolished yeah. <laughs> and then we watched the finals where uh i'd love to say that dragapult just feasted on lugia but lugia kind of feasted upon itself <laughs> for most of that game game one was close game one was close yeah game two and not it's close. not worth watching game two yeah game one was interesting there was a lot of back and forth yeah dragapult specifically mm. Dragapult with the Dracloak engine. <laughs> yeah. Is this the way? Have we been just wrong by shoving Pidgeot in there? Like, do you have any thoughts after watching those couple of games and probably your own Dragapult gameplay? Um, is it the wave necessarily? I don't know. It's certainly very strong. I think that everyone kind of understood that Dusknor paired with Dragapult is an extremely powerful combination, right? Being yes. able to just KO a Rotom with, with not even the damage from the attack, just residual effects, mm -hmm. right, is, is pretty insane. Yeah. Um, and the issue with Pidgeot consistently has been, if you play Dragapult and you play Pidgeot, there is not room to play Dusknoir. Mm -hmm. And so the solution that they came up with is, well, don't play Pidgeot. Whereas most people came to the conclusion of, well, don't play Dusknoir. Um, and I don't think very many people tried the other way. Uh, and clearly, we were <laughs> wrong to do so, right? Like, yeah. you don't win a regional by accident. You don't. Like... Mm, I'm sure I'll prove that wrong when I win regional. Don't worry. You're right. And like, sure, there, there have certainly been examples of people that had like insane Cinderella sun runs, but like uh, the deck worked. Like we all saw it work. Yeah. Um, I want to point out too, Ryuki is a name that we might not be the most familiar with. I'm going to speak for myself on that one and assume other people are in that same. Uh, we have a, a top 16 at Champions League Fukuoka, top 16 at Champions League Kyoto, 18th place at Sao Paulo, LAIC. We have 104th place at NAIC. And then we have a 28th place at Champions League Kyoto. Right. That is ridiculous to go back to that good players do well thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. That level of consistency. And we're, we're not even acknowledging the fact that like Limitless only has Champions Leagues for mm -hmm. Japanese tournaments. And only the and top so, 16 like, of any of them, right? Right. Well, wait, one of them is oh, a 28th, the, I think, yeah, right? The pre-COVID ones, they had, like, all of day have two more. results, and post-COVID, they've only been able to get the top 16s. Makes sense, makes sense. But yeah, like, good player does well. Uh, people love to clown on Japan. You were mentioning this earlier. People mm -hmm. are always like, oh, Japan's fake, and, like, I, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Yes, they play best of one. Is best of one an inherently more random format? Sure, but people see decks like Lugia and decks like Raging Bolt doing really, really well in these formats, and then they go, oh, Japan is such a joke. No, they're playing those decks in higher volume because they are better in best of one. Mm -hmm. If they played best of three, they would probably have a similar metagame to the West, if not a more advanced one, right? Because they get the cards before us. And so there's like I'll 80 times more players, right? So it's another, there's right. advancing the metagame faster, more brains, because tons of right. no names out there have come up with amazing stuff that yeah well you don't play the game you don't go to regionals etc right yeah right right exactly so i i think there's a lot of disrespect like kind of levied at at the japanese like tournament structure and stuff like that but like every single year we see japanese players come over to the west and just like have insane performances and perform insane at worlds and we still have this discourse which like what can you do but like this kind of innovation uh, I've been saying this on my on my streams and stuff for like weeks and weeks and to my students, everyone is like, I think Dragapult's fake, I think Dragapult's fake. And my answer is always, well, it's really easy to take Shrouded Fable Charizard. We have a year and a half of exquisite Charizard lists mm -hmm. and we can just, every time there's new cards, we know the places where we can take out so that we can have new stuff. We know what things you generally need to counter what stuff. Same with Raging Bull, right? We have a general skeleton, but we haven't had that with Dragapult because the deck has kind of sucked since it came out. True. And so having good players to like 
innovates the archetype in this way is insanely cool. We have he is our first ever, the first ever, right? In the history of the Pokemon TCG, our first ever Western Japanese player invite. The yes. first one ever, which is awesome. That is so sick to have such a unique and cool and innovative take on an archetype and then win the the first European regional of the season to be the first Japanese ever player to get an invite through the Western circuit. I, like this is like a monumental tournament result for me. Like, and yeah. Rahul got his first finals in a major. It's just, it's tons of firsts, bro. It's great. No, the results at Dortmund were, I think everything that I, as again, pretty much a fan at this point, wanted to see sure. out of the tournament, which is we saw Turtle do incredibly well, which is the hot new thing. We saw massive innovation coming out of the finals list, which as you have alluded to so many times, don't knock the list until not just you try it, but I th I'm pretty sure that there's a lot that's going to happen here. And we're going to see a ton of YouTube videos and Twitch streamers play this deck and not fully grasp. Yeah. Twitch.tv slash Joshi Washi. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you want to see me not grasp it. Yeah. Come, come check it out. Because the, the concept, too, I love the like get rid of the Pidgey. I have more Dustnor. You only set up two Dragapults most of every game anyway. Right. And that's why the right. Radiant Charizard was in a lot of lists. Well, mm -hmm. instead of that, okay, I'm going to give you two to three Dustnor prizes and I'm advancing my win condition, right? But yeah, uh, as you alluded to, the deck did incredibly well. This fancy new thing that are unfancy, actually, it's, I think that's the coolest part. And yeah. so that's fun. And then second place list is someone who has done incredibly well, is just furthering his reputation as the best player to not win a regional. I was so I was so ready for Rahul to do it so we can just say, all right, it's officially Grant Manley now. But no, it <laughs> is just continuing that. And the exact same 60. Everything about this was just so cool. We saw the thorns in top eight. We saw the Maridon in the bolt. I'm a huge fan of the results. I think it's so cool. And I'm Me so too. excited for Joinville results, hopefully, to live up to the expectations. We already know the best senior of all time i'm gonna say that happily juan in joinville so we'll see what the masters do too yeah do you have any predictions what do you think juan oh gosh the worst thing is everyone knows <laughs> everyone in there knows um i'm gonna say i saw a charizard in top eight and they thank pedro pertusi for the text which tells me pedro and william did not win <laughs> because or I'm assuming Charizard didn't win either. Otherwise, the tweet sure. would not have gone out in that way. So I'm going to say the worst thing, too. Fabrizio was in Europe. Fabrizio is another Ladam player who, yeah, did very really? well with Raging Bolt, right? I'm pretty sure I saw Fabrizio got like top 32 with Raging Bolt in Europe, which didn't even know. Shout out to, again, person we had on our world's meta discussion. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm purely stalling for time to try and think of what possibly won especially if it's not charizard <laughs> and it's not fabrizio who for some reason is a raging bolt fan now shout out to that yeah <laughs> i'm gonna say dragapult won down there too but a very traditional Ooh. dragapult deck they have the pidgeot they have the one of crispin and the everything that we've been seeing i'm gonna call it dragapult because it feasted on the charizards that brazil mm loves to play and i do love their list i will net deck a brazilian list of charizard all day every day yeah 100 percent. josh what do you think juan i think drago won same reason drago same reason. oh that's fair yeah. that's dragable <clears throat> yeah uh, i it's same reason I, I think drago probably won there's a lot of good uh there's a lot of good charizard players there's a lot of good guardy players over there and mm, so drago seems like a cool Although, who knows? Raging Bull is a pretty tough matchup. But I'll go, Dra I'll go Drago. I'll go Drago. Josh, if you, if the people would like to yell at you for being wrong about <laughs> either your Joinville prediction or any of the many things you've said slandering, for example, Lugia or Iron Thorns or anything else, where can the people find you? Any shout outs you might have? Yeah, uh, you can find me if you want to yell or agree with me, please. My like self-esteem might need a little boost after the, the hate that I get for, for Flaming Lugia. Uh, you can find me at DreamJew on Twitter. Uh, if you are interested in supporting my content, uh, I just uploaded my first ever YouTube video a, a day ago, uh, which you can find uh, Josh Frank PTCG. Uh, you can find me on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash Joshy Washi. It's Josh double E Wash IE. 
Um, and then, yeah, if you're interested in, in coaching, um, I'm also on Medify. Uh, I think as the time of recording this, I'm still number one. So if you just go to Medify and click on coaching for Pokemon TCG, you will see me going like this. Um, so you can click on that there. Uh, and yeah, shout outs, huge shout out to the Shuffle Squad, uh, my, my sponsor. Uh, and shout out to you, Kevin, for being such a gracious and kind host. Uh, and for reminding me that London is, in fact, not my favorite location. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, myself, you can find me on Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube at Metal Owners Magic Be sure to rate and review the show. Be sure to follow at Lake of Rage Pod on Twitter as well. This is another episode of the Lake of Rage Podcast. Catch you all next week.